records. And I thought, you know, I'm going to do this book that I just once again fell in love with. Uh, doing this series and realizing all the new stuff that's there that I, you, know, you don't see before. Though I wrote a commentary in this book. The very first book I wrote was a commentary in Romans uh, way back in 1973. And uh, thank God that it went out of print. See, my books go out of print very fast. <laughs> if you're a collector of Earl Palmer books, you have to get them very fast because they go out of print. Except that, would you believe it, Regent College has been bringing my books back into print one after another. And they brought that book back into print, and I'm so grateful to Regent College uh, Publishing for doing that. And, uh, but at any rate, uh, the book is so fresh and uh, it hit me with such force to go through it again. Uh, let's take a look at it then and have our own journey through uh, this most important letter that Paul wrote. You feel when you're reading it that Paul's aware he's writing a major work. It's much more crafted than his other letters, which tend to be written very spontaneously and... Uh, uh, almost uh, like you, know, you take Philippians where it's almost uh, impulsively written. Certainly the last book Paul wrote, 2 Timothy, very impulsively written. But this book, thoughtfully designed, it has a, a, a very, uh, in an almost Socratic fashion, he raises questions and speaks to them, raises questions and speaks to them all the way through, covers every major theme, uh, goes through, a, it's a systematic uh, journey through themes too. And written to people he's never met, actually been there. He's not been to Rome, but he's going to go to Rome. He writes it probably from Corinth. Uh, before he's gone down to Jerusalem and ended up arrested, you know, took the offering down to Jerusalem, ends up arrested, is in Caesarea for two years, finally gets so sick and tired of being there, doesn't write any letters from there, and decides to appeal to Rome. Uh, remember when uh, Herod Agrippa II came with Bernice and uh, he had a chance to share his faith there, and uh, he's getting tired of, the, uh, of, of, of this imprisonment. And so he appeals to Rome, sent off to Rome, uh, finally arrives in Rome, and is in arrest there at Rome. That's where he ends his life, and he does finally get to Rome. He wanted to go on to Spain after that. He tells the, the Romans that that's his goal, but he ends his, uh, his career with that fatal imprisonment at Rome. But he starts a letter, uh, like he starts all, uh, all of his letters, identifying himself, Unlike John, who tends to hide himself as an author, John, uh, Paul is more like the Jeremiah of the Old Testament, who doesn't hide himself at all and always talks about himself. And uh, he starts out, Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. Uh, and then this curious little, uh, uh, little uh, prologue, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures, the gospel concerning his son, who was descended from David according to the flesh and designated Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection. Uh, Paul doesn't start any other letter quite like this with almost a little creedal statement uh, that he starts with. And the word rizzo, designated there, is an interesting word. It, it, he's not talking about adoptionism here. God didn't adopt Christ as his son through the resurrection. But the word rizzo can mean recognized, uh, he, was, he was the son before, but he's recognized and validated. That's what that word means. Validated, uh, son of God. Because the great event of the defeat of sin, the defeat of death, the defeat of, of the devil happened at the cross. And then it's made visible to us and validated to us by the resurrection. And through whom we've received grace, the big word for Paul, this great word charis that Paul loves, surprise gift love, uh, is sort of his coined word in the love vocabulary of the New Testament, though he also uses the word agape. But he loves this word grace. It's going to be a big word throughout the book of Romans. Uh, and we've been given this grace and apostleship uh, for the sake of his name among all the nations. Another one of great Pauline themes is his call to all the ethna. The word nations here is ethna, all the ethnic groups, uh, including yourselves, he says, there in Rome. And then he says to God's beloved in Rome, called to be saints, Grace to you and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's cl little cliche that he has in every letter. He always says this, grace, that's his favorite word, and peace. He uses the Greek word, arene, but he's thinking shalom, uh, the great Hebrew word. The, the Jews always use that word 1,800 times in the Old Testament, shalom. It means wholeness, it means health. And then grace, surprise, gift, love. From God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of your faith proclaimed in the whole world. 
For God is my witness, whom I serve in my spirit, in the gospel of his Son, that without ceasing I mention you always in my prayers. Paul prayed for an awful lot of people. In fact, when we get to the last chapter of Romans, uh, chapter 16, it's like the New York phone directory of all the people he knows in Rome, even though he's never been there, all these groups of people, uh, names he names, uh, shows you how mobile, uh, mobile the early church was. Everybody was moving everywhere, going in all places. And so he says, uh, I pray for you, asking that somehow by God's will, I may now at last succeed in coming to you. And there we get the uh, mentioned by Paul that I want to get there. I want to come to you finally. Uh, that is so that we may be in, uh, mutually encouraged, so, so that I may impart something to you, spiritual strength, that we may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, yours and mine. And then he says, I've, uh, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that I've always intended to come to you. Uh, but thus far I've been prevented. Uh, he's got, he'd been going through all these Roman prisons one by one too, and that's taking time. In order that I may reap some harvest among you as well as among the rest of the Gentiles. And then an interesting line, for I'm under obligation both to Greeks and to barbarians. The Greek word barbarios is a word they used to refer to anybody that couldn't speak Greek. They were thinking mainly of the people to the north, the Huns and the, the Germans in the north, the, who couldn't speak Greek. And so I'm, I'm, under, I'm under obligation to Greeks because the whole Mediterranean world speaks Greek, but then there are people who don't, and the barbarians, both to the wise and to the foolish. I'm eager to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Okay, that's the beginning. It's kind of standard, except that at that point, Paul breaks into a manifesto statement, into a brilliant sort of statement that there's nothing like it in any other letter he wrote. And this statement is an electrifying statement. For I am not ashamed. It's almost like he steps back and once again thinks of that gospel of his son, the gospel of God that belongs uh, to God about his son. And then he says, for I am not ashamed. The word ashamed means blush, literally in Greek. Uh, you've got to remember in shame cultures, this is a very, very uh, loaded word. I am not ashamed, blushing, I'm not embarrassed uh, for the gospel or of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation. To everyone who has faith, to the Jew first, Chronologically, of course, the gospel starts with the Jews, and then it goes, as, as you know, Paul is the great uh, preacher of the gospel to the Gentiles, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it, the righteousness of God, this word dikaios, righteousness, as you know, when it refers to us as translated justification, when it refers to God translated righteous, has to do with the righteous character of God, the straight character of God, is one of the great truth words in the New Testament vocabulary. For in it, the righteousness of God, and here he uses a very powerful word, is revealed. Uh, there's another word for revealed that could be used, uh, which means just is disclosed, but he uses the powerful word apocalypsis here, has broken through by surprise. Uh, that's why when I wrote my commentary on, on the book of Romans, I titled it Salvation by Surprise, because it's this great surprise word that Paul uses. The word charis means surprise, Actually, you know, the root of charis, grace, is chara, joy, uh, surprise. And so now this strong word, apocalypse, apocalypsis, breakthrough. The righteousness of God has broken through faith for faith. Uh, uh, some interpreters thought he meant uh, faith, little faith for more faith. Uh, that could be sort of a charismatic interpretation of it. You start with little faith and you get more faith as you get more blessings. Uh, Karl Barth doesn't agree with that, and I agree with Karl Barth's interpretation. What he is saying is, faith for faith, it's a play on the Old Testament, amen, amen. Uh, like our Lord does before he speaks, he says, amen, amen. Because the Old Testament word for faith, amen, which literally means rock, it's a literal Hebrew meaning, but when amen refers to God, it means faithful. When it refers to us, it means faith. See, all the Hebrew words do double duty. And so when it refers to God, it means faithful. And so therefore, when it's doubled, it means faithfulness for faith. God's faithfulness for your faith. It's a, a tremendous insight into the understanding of faith, the dynamics of faith in the Old Testament. Faith is not a leap into the dark. Faith is a response to evidence. It's a response to the evidence of God's faithfulness. My faith means I put my weight down on God's faithfulness. When I became a Christian, Robert Boyd Munger presented the Christian faith at Lake Tahoe when I was a young undergraduate at Cal, and he put it this way, when on the basis of what you know about Jesus Christ, you're willing to trust in his trustworthiness. 
then you're ready to become a Christian. And that's how I became a Christian. I put my weight down on the trustworthiness of God that I discovered in Christ. And so Karl Barth says that's what he means by faith, faith. Not uh, a charismatic interpretation of little faith for more faith. Little faith when you start and then as you're filled with the Holy Spirit, more faith. No, it's not that. Rather, it's faith, faith. It's faithfulness for faith. Uh, in other words, the righteousness of God has broken through his faithfulness for our faith. And then Paul gives you his text like a good rabbi. Paul's being like a rabbi here. A good rabbi is always supposed to give you a text. As you know, the, the Midrash, the, the Mishra, and the, uh, the, the uh, Talmud, all these uh, Pharisaic documents that are so important in the time of the first century, are many of the, some of the, several of them found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, are all commentaries on the law. What a rabbi is supposed to do is give you a commentary on the law. That's what the Talmud is. The most important Jewish document next to the Bible is the Talmud, which is a commentary on the law, which means that you've got to have a text for everything. And our Lord did this in the Sermon on the Mount uh, when he started with Psalm 1 as the text for the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Blessed is the man who walks not in the way of uh, wickedness, but in the way of righteousness. So here, Paul decides to start his greatest book with a text. And the text is one he loves. He uses it also in, Gal in Galatians, the book of Habakkuk. And here it is. As it is written, he who through faith is righteous will live or shall live. As Martin Luther translates it, the just shall live by the faithfulness of God. See, that's the text. And with that, he begins the book of Romans. I'm intrigued with this great manifesto because all the great themes that we're going to see unfold in the book of Romans are here in this manifesto. But the thing that intrigues me in the manifesto, and maybe it intrigues you as well, is why would Paul begin, especially in a shame culture world, why would he begin with the most dreaded world, word in a shame culture? And the, the ethics of the Middle East is shame ethics. You see it profoundly in Islam. The, the, the word Muslim means you must honor the character and honor God and, so that he may not fall into any shame. And uh, it's so important in the Arab world, in the Jewish world, that there not be shame. And why would Paul then use that loaded word to begin his book of Romans? I am not ashamed. Why wouldn't he put it positively, I am proud of the gospel? Wouldn't that be better? If he'd taken a Dale Carnegie course, he certainly would know that's a thing to do. But why plant a negative word at the beginning of the book? I think he does it deliberately. Because he wants to dialogue with you through this book, and I think he wants to, before you say it, he wants to say it. It's sort of like if you, but you know, it's not, doesn't, isn't good salesmanship. Like if you were gonna sell a car, would you say to someone, by the way, I did not tamper with the odometer. <laughs> why even bring it up? Why even plant the seed if you're a used car salesman? Does that mean that these other cars around here, you did tamper with the odometer? You moved the odometer back? Why bring up a thing like that? And that's exactly what Paul does. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. In other words, I'm not embarrassed by the gospel. Well, why bring it up, Paul? Why might you be ashamed? And I think he does that deliberately because he wants his readers from the word go to wonder about that. Why would you be ashamed? And I think he gives you hints within the manifesto of four reasons that you might be ashamed. For example, uh, what if the good news, because he calls it good news, the gospel. That's a, you know, that's a secular word. It's not a religious word in the first century. It means just good. It's a message like if Alexander the Great's troops had a battle and they came back, they would bring good news. We won the battle. It just means good message. Uh, uh, why would he possibly be ashamed of this good message? Well, what if the good message about Jesus Christ were not true? What if it were not true? What if it were blatantly false? Then he would be ashamed if, if you, uh, who heard this good message, were to start asking too many questions. If you started asking questions or looking too deeply into something, uh, then uh, you'd, be, you'd be ashamed of it because it wouldn't bear that kind of scrutiny. So I say, uh, here's some good news, but... Uh, what if the good news is that at the very core of the good news is something that's untrue? A number of years ago, my kids knew that I did comedy. I used to do comedy. In fact, uh, with Dick Jacobson and I, who were both uh, young pastors at, at First Press Berkeley, I mean, at, at University Press, uh, 
did a, used to do a skit together that we got from Bud Abbott, Lou Costello, who's on first. We did it all over the place. And it's kind of a fun skit to do, you know, where it's the number one comedy routine of all time, really. Bud Abbott and Lou Costello did it about 8,000 times. It started on vaudeville, they did it on radio and television, where uh, Abbott and Costello who, who tells about this baseball team and says, well, who, do what I know the players? Of course, if you know the players, if you know good players, well, tell me the players, and well, who's on first, what's on second, I don't know, it's third base. And that's the great skit. And uh, uh, I don't know, and then, the, you know, all these different characters that are supposed to be playing on this team. So we did that skit, and my kids knew that I did it, so they bought the original show, the, uh, the original show that was done in 1944, uh, where Bud Abbott and Lou Costello first performed Who's On First on radio. And we listened to it, and, the, and it was the whole uh, Bud Abbott, Lou Costello radio show, and, and it was so funny, and the kids laughed at it, and it was just wonderful. But you know, in that tape, my teenagers, at that time they were teenagers, when we listened to the tape, they laughed, though they loved the Bud Abbott, they loved Who's On First, but they laughed more at the ads because those old radio shows, they put all the ads in, they laughed at the ads more than they did the show. The ads were hilarious. That show was put on by Camel Cigarettes. It was the Camel Cigarette Show. It started out with a, like the Norman Luboff Choir singing C-A-M-E-L-S. This wonderful song was sung at the beginning. And then a, about seven different voices were used in the ad. And a first voice comes on and said, yes, this is Camels. And, uh, they're, and then they, they made their big pitch, kind of a medical pitch. Camels, they're kind to your T-zone. That is, that's, do you remember that? If you're old enough, you do. That is T for, T for taste and T for throat. They're kind to the T-zone. And they started out that way, and then they went on, and we got into the show and did the show. Finally, the, they had a little sex scene where there was this man and his woman were on the veranda, and she says, my, you're smoking a new cigarette now, aren't you, honey? Yes, it's Camels. Kind to my T-zone, T for taste and T for throat. Oh, isn't that wonderful? And uh, <laughs> then, but the best part of the ad, the part that was most hysterical, was when uh, a very official voice came on and said, an independent research organization asked 176,500 doctors, doctor, what cigarette do you smoke? <laughs> it's true. Did you know the majority of those doctors said they smoked camels because they're kind of the T-zone, T for taste and T for throat? That's all a lie. Camels are not kind of the T-zone. They're not kind to T for taste and T for throat. They destroy the taste buds, and they destroy the throat. It's a lie. But yet, it was so friendly, and it was such good news. Uh, and I know, I listened to it when I was a teenager. You know, when I was a boy, we didn't listen to radio. We watched radio. We sat around and watched radio. And uh, I did, and Jack Armstrong, and all those shows. And we all took up smoking. Uh, I never took up cigarettes, though, because my dad said, don't smoke cigarettes. It's not a man's smoke. Smoke cigars. So I started with cigars. <laughs> But they, we took up smoking. Uh, uh, but it was tr not true. Supposing the gospel were like that, it sounds good, it's friendly, you use very persuasive language, surveys and all the rest, but it's not true, then you'd be ashamed of it. All right, let me ask a second question. What if the gospel were true, perhaps, in an encyclopedic sense? Uh, yes, Jesus Christ lived, uh, yes, that's a fact, it happened. But what if the good news were powerless in the face of the vast needs of humanity. You know, there are truths like that. Uh, then I would be sort of ashamed because these big statements are made about this good news, but when you actually get right down to it, the truth level just doesn't have enough implication quotient. It doesn't have enough implication to, about it that it matters in the real issues that we face in life. It's just sort of true, but it's not significant. It's a little bit like Deep Thoughts. You used to watch Saturday Night Live. Remember Deep Thoughts? Man, I got into those big. They would have the screen with the waterfalls and Niagara Falls and beautiful organ music, usually very gentle music, uh, and then a deep thought. I remember one of those deep thoughts was, here was one, the earth is old, but time moves slowly. <laughs> I want to tell you, it's a deep thought. Then it would say, deep thoughts, and then it would be, uh, on the cheer you up, cheer you up, and put it on a Hallmark card. Uh, we uh, we used to have a lot of fun making up those. One summer, my son and I were making up all kinds of deep thoughts, and we would kind of stun people that would visit us uh, with these deep thoughts. And we played a little scam, you know, uh, like we like he would try that one out. He'd say, "Dad, I thought of this thing. The Earth is slow." 
but time moves slowly. And I would say, John, you're onto something there. I mean, that, that's, a, I mean that's a deep thought. And uh, the people would be scratching their head. They, uh, and then we even made up some ourselves. Here's an original one we actually made up. You have my permission to use it. It's a deep thought. Once my son said to me one day, he said, Dad, you know on the one hand, people let you down, but on the other hand, they disappoint you. <laughs> and I, I said to John, I said, you know, you're onto something there. I mean, that, I mean, you're at a very deep level right now. I said, continue to work on that. <laughs> but notice, it's a truth. There's a kind of a truth to it. But so what? You know, uh, I think a lot of people think that about the Christian faith. Yeah, it's true. But what impact does it have? Uh, in uh, 1863, uh, the state of Pennsylvania wanted to dedicate a cemetery because of the fallen uh, men and women, uh, men mainly, who'd fallen at Gettysburg. And so they set up a tremendous occasion that was to, be, uh, that was to take place at Gettysburg. In fact, uh, Gary Wills got the Pulitzer Prize for writing this incredible book called Lincoln at Gettysburg. It tells the whole story of Gettysburg. What an amazing event it was to be, November 19th, 1863. They originally set the date for October, but they wanted a major speaker to speak, and they chose Edward Everett, the president of Harvard University, to be the main speaker. He'd once been Secretary of State, very famous man, the greatest orator in America at that time. He couldn't come. He said, in order to give a major speech like that, I needed another month to practice and to get ready for the speech. So they moved the date to November 19th because of Edward Everett. They built a special tent for him to have time to meditate out behind the, the dais where he was to speak. They also invited the President of the United States to give what they called appropriate remarks uh, because they did not want him to give a political speech. And so they tried to, to protect the, speech, the event from becoming a political event. But the, and so he didn't even get really a, a warm invitation, just an invitation to come, if he could come, to give appropriate remarks. And President Lincoln decided to go to give appropriate remarks. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, Gary, uh, Gary Wills has done a magnificent job in this book telling the whole story of Gettysburg, and he has all the speeches, everything that was said on that day. And the, the uh, Reverend uh, T.H. Stockton gave the invocation. It took 12 minutes, 12-minute invocation. Remember that, pastors. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Edward Everett stood up and spoke, and spoke for uh, two hours plus. And... Uh, it was, uh, it was a little bit like Deep Thoughts. I, I read the whole speech. It got rave reviews. New York Times raved about it, so be careful about things that New York Times raves about. Uh, he decided in his speech that he should tell the whole story of the Greek uh, tradition of cemeteries. And he gave an analysis of why cemeteries were built. And that's how he starts, the Athenian cemeteries. And he quotes poetry. For instance, here's a poem about three pages into his great speech. The olive grove of academy, Plato's retirement where the attic bird trilled his thick warbled note the summer long. I don't know about you, but that kind of gets you. I call it a deep thought. And uh, he told all about the Athenians and how they did cemetery. Then he went through the entire Civil War showing how bad the South was and how evil they were in, in starting the Civil War. But he went through every single battle and did an analysis of the Civil War and, uh, and finally ended up with uh, a speech that was considered a spellbounding speech. Uh, Abraham Lincoln, there's been a lot of debate about whether Abraham Lincoln, uh, they saw, uh, people have said, did he write the speech on the train coming down on an envelope? Gary Wills uh, does away with that myth. No, he wrote the speech carefully. Lincoln always wrote his speeches very carefully. And he carefully wrote it at the White House and wrote about three different versions of the short speech. He came down, he stood up to speak. They said that while er Edward Everett was speaking, he was making notes. People watching the president was sitting on the thing. And some people thought he was writing his speech because he was making notes on his one-page speech. Uh, I think I know, uh, if he did that, I think I know what he wrote while Edward Everett was speaking. Uh, and it was probably... Uh, in his speech, he was writing this. Uh, the world will little note nor long remember what we say here. <laughs> I think that's what he wrote. But it can never forget what they did here. 
Abraham Lincoln stood up and spoke for three minutes. It was so fast that the official photographer was still setting up his camera and the president had already sat down. That's why there's no picture of Abraham Lincoln giving his speech at Gettysburg. And yet when you read this book by Gary Wills, it's the greatest speech in American history. It set the whole stage for all public discourse from then on about how you talk to people. Uh, but Edward Everett gave a speech that was true, but it had no implication, real implication. I'm not surprised. Did you know who Edward Everett was, President of Harvard? He was a pupil of Ralph Waldo Emerson. Ralph Waldo Emerson took over a religious thought of the, of the 19th century. Let's face it, he was the darling of American Protestantism of the 19th century, by and large. Ralph Waldo Emerson uh, was a Unitarian. You should read his speech that he gave at the graduation of the Harvard Divinity School, where he told the, those students, don't worry about the Bible, worry about your, catch your own dreams and translate your own dreams for the people. He's famous for great, unforgettable deep thoughts, like one of his great ones was, hitch your wagon to a star. I like that. That's Ralph Waldo Emerson. I remember reading an article in New Yorker magazine once on an airplane, and I was reading it. It was about Ralph Waldo Emerson. And I read along and read along. And finally, I saw a line in that article, and I said, man alive, this line is so well written. It's got to, this, this article's got to be written by John Updike, who's one of my heroes. And I went to the end of the article, and sure enough, John Updike had written it, because nobody uses the English language like John Updike. And he is saying all about what Ralph Waldo Emerson and how influential he was in, in the early part of, of Updike's life. And then, but he makes this one comment about Emerson. He says, but the problem with Ralph Waldo Emerson is his ideas are like paint that doesn't stick to anything. And that's the hollowness and the emptiness of transcendentalism, of the Ralph Waldo Emerson brand. And by the way, I'm a Mark Twain fan. Mark Twain is always thought of as rejecting Christianity, but Mark Twain rejected the Ralph Waldo Emerson Christianity. Uh, you know, he was buried in a funeral service from a Presbyterian church when he finally died. And he was a cynic, and I love Mark Twain. But you know, it's this, and I've got a whole speech of Mark Twain where he made fun of Emerson. It's that shallowness he saw through. Paint that doesn't stick to anything. Well, what if the gospel were like that? What if the gospel were basically platitudes that you give on Sunday morning and good advice you give on Sunday morning, even with a lot of enthusiasm, but it doesn't stick to anything? Then you'd be ashamed of it because it's not what, it doesn't have power. It doesn't have staying power. It doesn't have implication.